Hello, I'm Juliette Foster and welcome to the first edition of Diplomacy in Dialogue, a series of shows in partnership with the German Foreign Office. Well, our topic today is the global coronavirus pandemic and its impact on people, politics and international relations. Well, to help us navigate our way through these complex issues, we have assembled a panel of experts. We're joined by Sebastian Groth, who's Director of Policy Planning at the German Federal Foreign Office, Maria de Mertes, who's the Deputy Director at the Bruegel Think Tank, and Dr. Alex Clarkson, Lecturer in German, European and International Studies at King's College London. So thanks to all of you for joining us today. But we're going to begin our interactive Q&A with our panel in just a few moments. But first, Let's take a look at today's topic in a little bit more depth. Well, the coronavirus pandemic is the biggest global story of 2020. It's taken lives and affected livelihoods around the world. Well, the numbers themselves tell an extraordinary story. Worldwide, over 19 million people are infected with COVID-19 in 188 countries, with more than 700,000 deaths reported so far. Currently, the United States, Brazil, India and Russia have recorded the highest number of cases. And experts are now predicting the European Union will fall into its deepest economic downturn since the Great Depression, and the signs are already surfacing. The German economy, the largest in Europe, contracted by 10.1% between April and June. Now, in some countries, the pandemic has caused severe political divisions. But in the European Union, we have witnessed unity, with its 27 member states recently endorsing an historic pandemic recovery deal worth a total of 750 billion euros. So is this hard evidence that a multilateral approach is the best way to handle a crisis of this magnitude? And what more can be done by the EU and its leaders to try to work together to prevent further waves of infection? What we do know, what can be said with some certainty, is that the end of this crisis is not in sight. OK, let's bring in our guests. And Sebastian Groff, I'd like to start with you first, because, look, 75 billion euros has been pledged, yet the negotiations that led to this agreement, they did reveal some rather deep divisions. Give us a very general idea about what these splits were, and more to the point, have they gone away? And does this mean that Europe itself can now maintain a united front? Well, thank you very much, first of all, Juliet, for... for for your introduction and the question. Um, um, basically, we had two groups of, of countries negotiating um, um, about the 750 um, um, billion euro package. Um, there was this, the so-called Frugal Four that then became the Frugal Five, so a number of countries that uh, took position for a more um, a moderate stance with regard um, to the volume of the package, but also of the distribution of the package between uh, loans and, and grants. Um, and there was the other group um, uh, of the European countries, mainly the most affected countries um, in the southern part of the Union, that were looking for a, a, a bigger volume um, and also for a bigger um, portion of, of grants um, because um, most of these countries already have a very high level of debt so it would not make uh, sense for them to take uh, new um, volumes of, of loans onto their balance sheets and I think in the course of these um, four days of negotiations uh, by the end of the day there was quite a convergence um, to, to act fast and also to act uh, substantially and so there was a consensus um, on the volume, on the distribution between loans and grants, and now um, the negotiations with the European Parliament that is playing a very, very important role, also in the context of the multi-annual financial framework and in the context of the recovery package, um, are already starting. And um, we are um, involved in this also as the European uh, Council presidency that uh, Germany took um, over on the 1st of July. But we are quite optimistic that we will see some progress um, after the summer break, so um, in September and, and, and in October. Right, so, so you expect the United Front to hold up, but then let's go back to a recent survey for the European Council on Foreign Relations, which I'm sure that you yourself are aware of. But just questioning Italians, 
They found that 4% of the respondents believed that the EU was a helpful ally during the pandemic, compared to 25% who favoured China. China, they believed, stepped up to the plate. So what does that say about how the public in a key member state actually perceives the bloc? Yeah, I think that um, this very poll that um, that you are referring to was made at the beginning um, of the first phase of the crisis, uh, where um, I think we have to admit this, um, the um, European answer to the crisis was not as European as it could have been. Um, so Italy was um, looking for equipment uh, and for help, and it took quite a while for the other European uh, partners that were all um, also um, taking care um, of their own populations in this very first phase um, of, the, of the crisis where a lot of unknowns were, were still um, out there, um, that, um, that Italy and the Italians especially felt a little bit uh, alone. And then um, came in China um, with a rather limited uh, number of, of masks and, and specialists and, and experts. And China did a, did a very good job in selling um, their contributions. And I think if you look now to the polls and also to the Italian mood in general, uh, especially after the summit that uh, took place uh, two weeks ago, I think that the mood uh, shifted again in Italy and that there is much more hope and uh, expectation and also um, positive feelings towards um, Brussels and towards this uh, spirit of European uh, solidarity. So I think. Um, we as Europeans, we learned our lessons uh, in this uh, early phase of the crisis and the poll that you are citing also gave, gave, up, gave us a head up, heads up that we have to do something. OK, so Maria de Mertzis, let me bring you here because, look, it, there were lessons to be learned and from what Sebastian has said, that is exactly what has been happening. Europe has been taking these issues to, to heart. But is there a risk that if it somehow loses its way, it could become irrelevant in a post-pandemic environment. There is so much at stake here. I think it's, uh, it's unlikely. I mean, the, the decisions that have been made uh, by the European uh, institutions, a number of different European institutions actually, are so binding and so big that it's unlikely to, to lose momentum. There is now the implementation phase. We're going to implement all these measures that we've decided upon. So there, there, there is no momentum to be lost here. The measures will come into place, policies will come into place. And, you know, if there is more policies that need to be taken, we we'll need to see uh, uh, about that in, in the autumn and, of course, in the new uh, phase of the pandemic. I think the EU has done uh, all it's could um, in the past uh, in the past few weeks it has taken mom momental decisions in terms of the size of the policies that they have put uh, forward certainly by comparison to the previous crisis so I think the EU has really done after the initial phases and here really certainly I agree with what Sebastian said now it has taken so many measures uh, that you really can see European co cooperation in action right but was COVID-19 the wake-up call in other words had it not been for COVID-19, would we have actually seen this momentousness, this determination to fulfil its purpose? I think that's, uh, that's unlikely. You see, a change only happens through dramatic events and the EU is no different in this respect. You know, big institutional, architectural changes, as we have seen in the past, happen when there is absolute need for them to happen. They do not happen unless there really is an absolute need for them. We saw that back in 2012 with Banking Union, a monumental architectural change. We see it now with the increase of the EU budget, albeit once, but still a mom momental increase of the EU budget in terms of putting money forward uh, for fighting the pandemic. Uh, you know, I, I think I, I wouldn't have seen such an increase in the budget unless there was an incredible need for it. But the important thing here is when there was a need for it, uh, the EU did manage to step up. Right. And, and Dr. Alex Clarkson, I'd like to bring you in here at this point of the conversation, because look, the, the vibes I'm getting is that the EU is very committed to the principle of working together. Does that therefore mean that the every man for himself mentality has run out of rope? Because there were some countries which were quite guilty of that, even before the pandemic. I think that depends on which policy field you look at. I and mean, that's one of the interesting aspects of European integration, that in every policy field, you have a level of integrated response at different levels. I mean, as has been pointed out in terms of the Eurozone and, and the vulnerabilities from past crises, I think the Euro European Union responded very quickly in developing this financial and economic aid package, largely because these vulnerabilities are already known. Where I have greater concerns is in the extent to which the EU can respond to crises surrounding it. 
the youth find itself, finds itself in several neighborhoods in North Africa, in the Levant, in the Middle East, uh, in the East and Eastern Europe, where you have a number of different states under extreme pressure from COVID and a number of other crises. Lebanon is a case in point where the EU is going to have to react very rapidly if it wants to secure its borders, secure stability around its borders, and ensure that corona, a rise in coronavirus cases in these countries doesn't suddenly fall back onto the EU itself. And this is an area in terms of projecting EU geopolitical power outwards, where EU institutions are still not very coordinated and often react in a very weak and uncoordinated fashion. Right, so, so given those factors, again, underpinned by COVID-19, what strategy should the EU try to embrace in the wake of a second wave of that pandemic? pandemic, And what happens if that strategy fails? Because again, this is a high risk game. There is so much at stake. I think at this point, I mean, if we look at places like Libya or Lebanon or policy towards Ukraine and Russia, the EU needs to develop the level of coordinated response and integration that it has, say, in terms of Eurozone policy and increasingly in policy involving public health, which is essential to managing coronavirus within the bloc. If the EU does not develop the same kind of integrated systems and level of coordination where somebody at the center can bang heads together if, say, Rome and Paris disagree about how to handle events in Libya, then it's not just geopolitical stability or military security stability that becomes a problem. It becomes a problem when instability in these countries means that they cannot handle the virus, they cannot handle the COVID-19 crisis, just look at Lebanon right now, and where that develops migration waves, insecurity, destabilization, that in the end means the EU will have to handle these crises down the line. The faster it can respond, the more it develops a shared rapid response mechanism to deal with crises along its borders and crises in states that neighbor it. Lebanon, for example, is a neighboring state of the EU through its sea border with Cyprus. And the faster it can react, the faster it can staunch problems and ensure that the virus is handled in these states, as well as all the other problems that they face. Has COVID-19 put the EU in the last chance saloon? Alex? No, I, I don't think so. I think what it does is, as, it, as with every state system it's confronted, China, the United States, Canada, every state it's confronted, it, points, it, it has pointed to the vulnerabilities in these states. And actually, in terms of the EU's rapid response over issues such as Eurozone consolidation, economic aid, it's shown how much the EU has learned from previous crises. But I suspect in the coming months and years, it's also going to hit where the EU is weakest, namely its ability to project geopolitical power outwards, its ability to stabilize neighboring states, its ability to, say, get countries like Italy and France on the same page when it comes to dealing with a crisis in places like Libya. And this all impacts in terms of public health. If a country like Libya or Egypt or Lebanon has a high level of coronavirus cases and is destabilized and collapses, then that very quickly makes it difficult to contain both the virus and other forms of insecurity in these states, which will very swiftly come across its borders and affect EU states on the front line in the Mediterranean or Eastern Europe. Okay, Sebastian Groth, can I come to you? Because the, in a weird, strange sort of way, you could argue that COVID-19 has become a platform for advocating the importance of countries working together. Now, if that's the case, is multilateralism strong enough to undermine the nation state narrative that has dominated the political landscape? Well, um, I, I don't think that this is um, really a contradiction, a nation state and multilateralism. You need nation states to um, construct and, and build up a, um, a functioning multilateralism that is based on a sort of um, cooperative uh, sovereignty of states. And that's what the EU all is about. It's, it's a concept of, of pooled sovereignty, but the nation state still has a role to play. So this is the multi-level uh, governance idea. What, what I would like to stress, though, is that we have to think more innovatively about new forms of multilateralism. And there, I think, what the EU set up in the early um, uh, days of, of May um, with a um, digital online uh, conference, pledging conference, for the um, vaccine accelerator um, uh, and and I think um, 7.5 billion euros came together is 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 such a new form on, on, of multilateralism involving states involving multilateral institutions involving private uh, foundations philanthropists companies industry and I think in the face of this crisis, this is exactly uh, what we need. 
Um, and um, I'm not too pessimistic that um, this crisis uh, is a trigger for this new form of multilateralism. And the EU has a very, very strong role to play in this regard. Let's take that idea a little bit further. I want to bring in Maria here because we had the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen who said that the seven-year budget deal and recovery fund was, in her words, next generation Europe. So do you share that, that sense of optimism in that statement that the EU will emerge in a much stronger position from this crisis? If you'd ask me uh, maybe six months ago uh, if there was ever going to be a uh, more centralization of fiscal powers in the EU, I would have been uh, very pessimistic. I, wouldn't have, uh, I would have thought that the EU is capable of centralizing more uh, uh, money uh, to basically deal with common problems. Here we are. Um, uh, we are now in August 2020 and we have almost doubled, not quite, uh, but almost doubled uh, the EU budget. This is unprecedented um, and, and most of it will come in the form of grants and money that will be directed to certain purposes. And this is money that they effectively will pull together to help countries for certain needs. This is unprecedented. It's, it's really quite uh, uh, incredible by comparison to where we thought we were, get, we were heading uh, about uh, six months ago. So yeah, I am actually very optimistic about the direction that the EU travels. I think this is uh, uh, very good news in terms of providing the solidarity that I believe European citizens are asking for. In the elections last May, about a year ago now, um, the European elections, I mean, you really saw the unprecedented participation of the citizens in European elections. This was uh, the first time that the European citizen says, look, the types of problems that we're facing, and this is before the pandemic, require European solutions, if not global solutions. And I think that uh, the EU has managed to come together in, in actually a relatively short time and deal with an unprecedented problem with very effective means. Which begs the question, Dr. Dr. Clarkson, that with this unprecedented fiscal behaviour we've, that we've seen, what will you, EU diplomacy itself look like in the post-pandemic world? And from the perspective of the public, will it be in any way different to what they're used to? Now, I think this is again where we come back to the extent to which EU integration depends which policy field you're looking at. Um, to, to back up what Maria was saying, in, domestically, internally, we're seeing a real good, strong push towards centralization, which is essential. If every part of the EU system is dependent on the other, and the EU, Germany, or France, or Italy need to make sure that the public health systems of Lithuania, or Latvia, or Romania, or Portugal are all pretty much at the same level, are all able to cope with the crisis in the same way, if this level of integration is to be kept, and something more state-like is to emerge through EU integration. The problem is, is that while this level of centralization is to be observed internally, and has really made tremendous leaps forward, the EU cannot isolate itself from the world outside. And the problem is, is that when it comes to diplomacy outward, when it comes to dealing with states like Libya or Lebanon or Egypt, where if their public health systems cannot handle the pressures of coronavirus, we will see instability. We will see knock-on effects of a, on a whole set of other issues, and it will affect the EU. There we often see the EU and its external action service at in a weak position because the various member states pursue rival agendas, and it's very, very difficult for the Commission, for central EU leaders, for member states like Germany that want to bring everybody to get on the table, to bang heads together and to make sure that, say, Paris and Rome and Madrid are all following the same line. And this is, I think, where we have variable levels of integration, strong integration at the center, strong integration internally, but weaknesses in terms of dealing with the world outside that I think could come back and cause further crises for the EU in the 2020s. OK, then. Well, let's break off for a few moments to get the thoughts of the public. This is what they had to say when we asked if they thought that governments had done enough in the face of the pandemic. We are from Germany and we see that like here uh, or in France, for example, it's a bit different. So in Germany, um, it's more strict, the rules, and in other countries, it's more hmm, wear a mask, but it's not important to keep distance or something like this. All the government uh, of Europe must work to get, uh, together for, uh, to fight against this, this virus. Europe is very important in this case. We understood that it was bad in Italy, we understood that it was bad in Spain, um, but no, I wasn't aware of any coordinated effort. I think they do what they can with the information they get uh, day after day, so 
I think the reaction of each government is quite good till now, but uh, we'll see what will happen in the next few weeks. Um, I work in the film industry and it's been hit really hard by it, as in nothing happening right now, so I'm just so eager for that to, you know, start up and I don't know. No one can give me answers to when, so it's, it's a bit scary right now. During this whole corona situation, I felt like the government didn't really give us guidelines. Only it, it took a long time before we actually knew if we even had to do exams or if we were even able to graduate. So that's my greatest, um, my biggest advice for them, just to be more clear. I don't think it had a joint uh, multilateral response. I am very much in favour of the European Union and I was very disappointed that each country act on a as a kind of knee-jerk reaction and uh, countries were not communicated, not helping each other. Well, the thoughts there of the public. Let's just have a reminder or round-up of some of the main points that emerged there. We heard that uh, countries didn't help each other. There were no answers or indeed guidelines. In other words, communication was poor and there was no sense of a coordinated approach. Although having said that, one of our box poppers was very favourable about the EU, but there was that remark, see how they get on in the next few weeks. And Maria de Mertzis, I'd love to get your reaction to that box popper, more specifically, what it thinks you tells us, or tells, tells the EU about the way that it's regarded by the general public, because it does seem that there's still quite a bit of work to go in, in making that relationship more connected. Yes, I mean, I certainly share some of the sentiments that uh, we've heard from the public. There is no doubt, and I think Sebastian also raised this point, that the initial reaction uh, was a very defensive reaction, and it was as though everybody for themselves. Uh, there was also, you know, a refusal of export of, of vital uh, things that countries needed. This was really uh, not on, and it was not certainly in line with the principles of the EU. So certainly there were mistakes made, and, and the issue of communication, of course, uh, it's vital and, and, you know, failed us in a number of respects. I like to believe that uh, human nature is very defensive, and, you know, some of it is justified. But after that, very quickly, the EU uh, realize that, you know, this isn't the way to deal with the problem. There, need, there is a need for coordinated action. Now, one, one point I will say is that the speed at which the disease uh, caught up with the countries was actually quite different. You know, it started with Italy. Italy had a very steep learning curve to, to uh, you know, in terms of how to deal with the, with the disease. So some of the differentiation in the way that uh, countries reacted is actually justified by the disease themselves. Uh, but I think the, co the communication aspect is, is a very important one. And this is the bit that I think the biggest learning has been had. From now on, I think countries have learned a lot about how to deal with the disease and, and you know, there is communication between countries. More needs to be done in terms of travel advice, uh, in, in terms of, you know, what happens to the things that affect everybody's life, things from when do the schools open. Uh, we heard one of our, uh, one of our speakers say things about can we take exams. You know, these are crucial, they're very important, they will depend very much on what happens in September when we will see, uh, dare I say, the second phase uh, uh, of, uh, of the disease. That's right, because I, I, I guess the worry is, as well is whether COVID-19, particularly in that second wave, whether it has the potential to create or indeed widen a gulf that exists between the public and the EU itself. Are you fearful of that? Actually, I'm not. I think, I think that much we have learned. I think now, first of all, we have more experience with the disease. We've had, uh, you know, uh, we learned the hard way, as it were. And this time around, there's going to be a lot more exchange uh, of information between countries, uh, between communities within, within countries. I think that's also very important. Uh, I am actually hopeful that the second time around, having gone through the first phase, things will go, uh, will go smoother. And I certainly hope that the issue of communication uh, will be handled much better this time around. And Dr. Alex Clarkson, if they don't get the communication message right, is there a risk of estrangement between the public and the EU? And is that effectively a rejection of multilateralism? I think one of the most fascinating paradoxes, particularly about recent polling in Italy, is that while you have frustration with the EU, it's not necessarily frustration that expresses itself in rejection of European integration. It expresses itself in demands for further EU action. And I think that's a very, very interesting shift. Maybe a few years ago, even in the populist wave during the Eurozone crisis, you had a lot of serious discussion that if the EU didn't perform, 
departure or Eurosceptic messages of departure might be most necessary. Now in countries like Italy or Greece or Spain, you have demands that the EU do more. And in that sense, you have people responding to the EU much more in the way they respond to national governments. If we take an example, if the citizens of Suceava, a region in Romania, are frustrated with their central Romanian government, they make more demands of the Romanian government. They don't ask to leave Romania, they just want more, the Romanian government to do more. And we're seeing something quite similar on the EU level. Citizens aren't saying, if you don't do anything for us, we want to leave. They're saying, you need to do more for us because we see ourselves as part of your system and your system needs to serve us. So in a sense, it's in, it's, it's, it, it is frustration and skepticism, partly because the EU is not very good at communicating the basic things it does to enable crisis response. Here, the ECDC, the European Center for Disease Control, could play a more central role. But in terms of public responses, it's not led to the kind of Euroscepticism of, we want to leave. It's led to the kind of political engagement of, you are here to serve us, we want more, we want you to do more and integrate more. And that's actually a very, very interesting shift in terms of discourse and attitudes to European integration. Because there were some academics who felt that, again, because of these communication issues and the irritation that some members of the public felt towards the EU, that perhaps it put uh, the surviving liberal democracies on life support. And if you like, COVID-19 perhaps made it inevitable that uh, it would be gasping for its last breath. But I mean, is, is there any fairness in that? Is it possible that if the EU doesn't get it right, then the, 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 the liberal democracies could find themselves standing on even dodgier ground? I think a lot of the responses to the EU's struggles around coronavirus had an air of people refighting the last war. So many of the people analyzing the EU from my generation in particular have been shaped by its recent crises from the financial crisis and Eurozone crisis onwards. So they were looking backwards. And in that sense, I think a lot of what's happened in terms of EU responses and public responses haven't necessarily matched previous experiences. This is a new environment, it's a new kind of crisis, a new kind of system. But it also, in my opinion, means to a great extent that the core problems of the EU responses, the core sources of crisis in the 2020s are being missed. And I think these are primarily to do with the EU's weaknesses and inability to coordinate power projection outwards in dealing with all of these neighboring states and the crises that they're facing, partly because of coronavirus. That's the next war, so to speak. That's the next campaign. In many ways, it will be a very real war because it will involve the use of military power. And I think that's the next crisis facing the EU that is sort of being missed to an extent because people are refighting the crises and refighting the arguments of its past crisis rather than facing up to what's going to hit it in the future. I'd like to get your response to that, Sebastian Groth. What, what, what's your take on that, to what you've just heard? Well, I, I'd like to come back to, to the question um, that you brought, brought up with regard to liberal democracies. I would not be as, um, as pessimistic. Um, I mean, the, this, this COVID crisis is a, is a challenge um, to, to each and every society and state and political system. And um, we analyzed it um, quite from the very beginning also as a systemic competition in how far different forms of governance, different forms of democracy, or also not so democratic uh, states, um, are really in a position um, to manage this crisis and um, to also steer um, the discussion with transparency, also with a fact-based, scientifically-based arguments um, and uh, in a transparent and inclusive manner. And I think if you look not only to Europe, but also to countries like, like um, South Korea and also to Taiwan, um, the, you see a number of, of democratic um, um, states and democratic uh, systems that are doing quite well. Um, so I'm not too uh, pessimistic. And the second point I'd like to make also with regard to the European Union, is if you if you look to to the overall reaction to this crisis globally since January February of this year, there's only one really multilateral combined substantial uh, political approach, and this is the European one. You haven't seen this from other areas of the world, and you haven't seen this so far from other levels of, um, of global cooperation. So I would say for the time being, um, we are on the right path here. Okay, the right side of history. And Maria de Mercis, I mean, look, this idea of a generation gap has, has been mentioned in the course of this discussion, but would you say that 
one of the things we've learned from this crisis is, is that perhaps young people are more in favour or more supportive of multilateralism, whereas older people may be a bit more sceptical, haven't survived the banking crisis, and perhaps uh, they, they're generally disillusioned with the, with the direction in which Europe is going, that perhaps that's made them more pessimistic, whereas with younger people, they, they see sunshine coming in through the window. Is, is that your, your perception? I think the differences between generations are, are actually uh, rather complicated. There is a lot to discuss here in terms of, uh, of uh, perceptions. Um, if you think about indebtedness, which is uh, you know, one of the biggest problems actually that, that the global economy is faced with, and no doubt will face even harder in the months to come, that has got direct implications about the ability of each generation to deal with its own future. Um, so I think there are, there are different issues here. M one important, I think, um, realization is that uh, the, the public health in general, but mostly the young, have realized that whatever the challenges that we have coming, moving forward, uh, we require global solutions. Uh, at the very least, we require uh, coordinated solutions in the immediate vicinity, but better, we require global solutions. I mean, if you think about climate change, which is the, perhaps the number one problem with which the young generation really is, uh, is occupied with, uh, there, you know, they demand global solutions, and they certainly demand uh, solutions at the European level, at, at you know, a coordinated level. So I think that is, that is an important uh, realization, that you can only achieve good and sustainable solutions uh, if you are uh, if you actually talk to each other multilateralism is uh, is a way of doing that and europe is, is very much had always been in fact and remains um, a big an advocate a big advocate uh, of multilateralism and i'm really delighted to see that it is the young that are pushing uh, this more than anybody else but quite frankly i don't believe that the old do not like multilateralism i think there are differences but i think in general on average uh, the European public believes uh, in coordinated solutions with the young who, by the way, will bear most of the burden, uh, the big advocates of it. Yeah, I'd like to bring in Dr. Dr. Clarkson because, again, looking ahead to, to build this, this new strategy going forward in this post-pandemic world, is it inevitable that the European countries that perhaps survived relatively unscathed the COVID-19 pandemic, they are the ones who are better suited to build and navigate that strategy. In other words, well, Germany, certainly, because it, it's, it's the biggest economy, so it has the heft, but also France, its regular partner. Is it inevitable that that responsibility will fall to them? It also would include Italy. I think the performance of the Italian state has, I mean, I wasn't surprised by it, but the performance of the Italian state has been impressive, and they have a lot to contribute to this. I think in a wider problem, that the EU faces is that the EU states have become accustomed to working together with the US or expecting US leadership. And either temporarily over the next 18 months to two years or perhaps more long term, the EU might face a situation where the United States is neither willing nor capable or able to lead. And I think this is the interesting question for the EU. Will the EU be able to step up in a situation where the United States is no longer a functioning partner? I don't necessarily believe permanently, but possibly for stretches of time as it sorts its own internal difficulties out. And that's actually maybe the next big question for EU integration. Can the EU be the central actor? Can the EU be a central player that can coordinate global responses if it can no longer rely on the United States? And if we were talking beforehand about the survival of liberal democracy, if there was ever evidence that liberal democracy needed another pole, another power, a European pole, and maybe a Japanese or East Asian pole to keep it going, if the United States is no longer capable of functioning. This is a crisis that pretty much shows that the EU does need to set up, step up and does need to lead. And let's see, I'm, I'm, we'll have to see whether it's capable of doing so. And let me bring in Sebastian Groff. Do you think the EU is capable of that responsibility further on down the line? And particularly big countries like Germany, there may well be political and financial compromises. Are they willing to do that when they have to balance it up against uh, domestic concerns? Um, well, I think we are on a good uh, learning curve here. Um, the European Union, as, as a union, is still one of the most important uh, payers um, in the multilateral system. So now it's up to us to become also a central player in the system. Um, and I think if you look, for example, to the WHO um, and the WH, um, the World Health Assembly that took place in May, um, you've seen already a little bit of this conceptual and political leadership of the European Union because it was a proposal of the European Union that um, was then um, 
adopted um, by unanimity um, by the World, World Health uh, Assembly in a very, very complicated situation where we had a strong antagonism between the big players um, like, like China and the US on, on some central questions on the role of the WHO. And I think the, um, what, what, what we see right now is that the EU is becoming aware of what Alexander uh, was talking about also um, um, a, a US leadership that is not as strong as it was in the years before. And in order to fill uh, this gap or this void uh, politically, financially, conceptually, um, it is up also to the Europeans. Um, otherwise, um, other countries, other actors might fill this gap um, that follow not uh, um, our um, values and, and our norms and our normative uh, approaches. So I think there's also some sort of operational uh, pressure now that the Europeans get their act uh, together. Whereas um, Germany is concerned, um, um, I think um, the um, um, positioning of the German public vis-a-vis -vis the European Union is still quite a very pro-integrationist and, and pro-European. Uh, and um, what we have seen in the discussions in the context of the European Council and with the French-German proposal about this 750 billion uh, euro package is a real uh, paradigm shift also um, for the German discussion especially. Um, so um, I would say that um, we are um, now also with um, this role as a presidency of the European Union very much uh, trying to be uh, a moderator of European interests within within the European Union, but also a motor of European interests in trying to move uh, things uh, things forward. And both in a spirit of of solidarity in the domestic sphere, so the Europeans have to help uh, mutually um, themselves, but also in the spirit of sovereignty in the in the outer sphere. So that means strengthening the um, a European capacity to act and being a more global, a more active uh, global actor on the global stage. OK, then let's break away from our panel for a few moments, because what I want to do now is to, well, introduce you to the public's response to the second of our big questions. And we asked if they thought governments were prepared for a potential second wave of COVID-19. I think if there was a second wave, the EU would definitely be better prepared in understanding um, the coordination that's needed to um, for movement of people. So coordinated lockdown, um, you know, uh, attempts when hotspots flare up. I don't know how prepared they will be in terms of uh, equitable distribution of, of treatments and, and further tests. Yes, I believe that the governments are fully prepared because we've gone through the first wave and we've seen the good job that they've done. If there's a second wave, the government are prepared, the citizens are fully prepared as well. That I believe. I think letting people go abroad, like to Italy or Spain, is a really stupid decision. I honestly think that we should have just stayed at home and urged people to just stay at home actually. I don't know. I really don't know. Um, I think they they try to plan as they can, but uh, it's quite difficult, and it's also depending on uh, what the people, well, what uh, all citizens will do in the next few days, next few weeks. If the people uh, uh, become a little bit more um, aware of the real situation. Or if there is a second wave, I think they are better prepared and I definitely hope so. I mean, obviously everybody was caught by surprise in the first one. Um, so yeah, I think they would be better prepared for, for the future. Yeah. If there is a second wave, I would hope that they would work together. I, uh, I hear that countries are beginning to talk about their own uh, boundaries again. Uh, I hear that my country origin is already planning, thinking of a kind of banning people or, or imposing a lockdown of some sort. Um, I am not sure whether there is enough of communication, but I do sincerely hope that some lessons will be drawn from the first uh, um, incident and, and uh, it would be uh, 
all the countries will be working together. Uh, I think now they are better prepared because it happened once and now we know better what we have to do when something like this happens. Well, the views there of the public communication came up, but overall, it does appear as if people are hopeful about Europe's ability to handle a second wave of COVID-19. The question, of course, do our panel share that optimism? Dr. Alec Clarkson, let me start with you, because look, where we are now, there have been outbreaks in other parts of, of Europe, in, in regions, etc., certainly over here in the United Kingdom. But then it has spawned this talk about the hunt for a vaccine, the deadline to be met quickly. Could the hunt for a vaccine undermine that hopefulness? Bearing in mind that one of the Vox Poppers, touching on a key point, actually said, well, referenced the equitable distribution of a treatment. Finding a vaccine to COVID-19 is the big holy grail. And whoever comes up with that treatment will have extraordinary geopolitical power. Um, I, and a lot of this comes down to expectation management, as, as we've seen in the UK. Um, so if you look at the issue in terms of a finding, finding a vaccine, I mean, what we see is several different projects running in parallel. And even though it might be temporarily a geopolitical tool for whoever gets there first, there are multiple approaches and projects that indicate there would be several vaccines in play that would balance that. I think an issue of concern is expectation management once a vaccine is achieved. Because there's a difference between having a workable vaccine and then rolling it out industrially and, and preparing public health systems to distribute it to wider populations. So one of the key tasks facing European governments in the EU is to basically communicate to people that when a vaccine is reached, that doesn't necessarily mean that you know, uh, public attention and effort needs to slacken. There's going to be several months until the vaccine is um, rolled out across Europe and across globally, where a lot of measures will still have to stay in place. And that will be a huge challenge, because once a vaccine is arrived at, many people will want normalization possibly quicker than it's possible. So that's a huge challenge in terms of communications, a huge challenge in terms of expectations management, and also a huge challenge in terms of projecting power outwards to help all those countries around the EU that don't have the EU's public health systems and resources to roll out a vaccine um, in a way as quickly as possible that the EU needs as much as they, do, they need. Can I pick up on that point about expectations and really throw it to the other panellists to find out whether you, whether you, you share that? I mean, have, well, Mar Maria de Mertz says, has the EU managed public expectations about a vaccine successfully? Or do you feel that it somehow got caught up in the hype of all this? It's all about finding a cure and somehow being first in the race without looking at the much bigger implications, as, uh, as have been pointed out by Dr. Alex Clarkson. I mean, I, I certainly believe that one of the, uh, you know, impressive things, and I say that rather reluctantly, is the fact that, uh, you know, all countries, and I follow news actually in different countries uh, because of the nature of my personal life, uh, have been very quick and very clear in relying on science. All the decisions that have been made, you know, some of them with political flavors, uh, but have really been based uh, on, on facts and on what science is telling us. And science doesn't have all the answers because science is also learning. So I think in terms of that, I think I'm very encouraged and it shouldn't be any other way. But, uh, you know, in this, uh, in this day and age of fake news, it's, it's very important to, to emphasize how clear uh, science is uh, as the only solution uh, to these types of problems. And I think that uh, I think all countries in the EU, at least the ones that I follow, Follow, uh, have been uh, very successful in terms of telling the public what they know based on scientific facts. So I think in terms of management of expectations, we all know that we need to listen to the scientists. And as they learn, we learn. And a very big uh, thing that will only determine the success uh, of our fight against the pandemic is uh, how quickly the public is educated. And this is now the big uh, next problem is have we educated the public in terms of dealing with the, uh, with the pandemic. The shutdowns, you know, we, we all Close, the, uh, close ourselves inside our homes. In the second wave, in the second phase of the, of the pandemic, the young are out uh, and the young are now the ones that are transmitting the disease in most countries that I, that I follow. We need a, a new type of communication that is directed to the young to try and you know, alleviate exactly that particular problem. So all of this is being done, is being done based on hard facts and uh, with very, very good and clear intentions. Um, I mean, as I said, there is so many uncertainties here that you know you can't say that we have all the answers. But if we follow the principle of listening to the scientists, 
communicating clearly and simply. I think that is the best way of managing expectations and at the same time educated the public as new information comes in. And Sebastian Groth, is, is that your take on this? Do you feel that the EU has actually been successful in managing expectations about this vaccine, more particularly how quickly we can have it? Because you know what, we're hearing some governments outside the bloc talking about having a vaccine before the year's out and their own medical advisors saying, well, hang on a minute, you've got to be a bit more realistic. What are we hearing from the EU that somehow stands as a counterweight against the other narrative? Well, I think for the time being, it's it's really too early to, te to tell. We know that there are about 150, 160 uh, trials uh, going on. A lot of, um, of them, or at least some of them, already in phase three. But what we all also know is that phase three is, is called the death valley of vaccines. So that's where most of the candidates um, don't survive. Uh, not not the, the candidates in terms of um, people who, who use it, but um, of course the vaccines. So that means we are not there yet. And I um, fully share what um, Alexander and Maria said um, with regard to expectation management. Um, we have so many unknowns about the production and then about the distribution and then the application. We don't even know if we would need one day one shot, two shots or three shots or how long the immune system uh, you know, will be activated by, by a vaccine. So um, uh, in, in, in so far, I think we have to prepare our publics um, and our societies that it's um, more or less the, the non-pharmaceutical interventions that will lead the way um, um, for the next months at least. So we are looking, uh, we are looking uh, more broadly into mid-2021 as far as, as, as I read um, uh, the briefings and, and, and the scientific um, estimations um, about, about um, the success or the progress in, in, in research. I also would like to stress what Maria said about this um, scientific approach that we are following both in Europe but also on the national level. I think this is very, this is very good, this is very adequate um, and we are all together in this, in this learning curve and by the end of the day many of the decisions that we have to take um, are political decisions but the decision-making process by itself is fed by, um, by scientists and not only, I'm not talking only about virologists, but it's also a question of psychology, of sociology, of course, a lot of economy also. And, and um, it's up to the political level to then um, uh, bring together all these different positions and, and make, um, make wise and good political decisions. And what I would say so far is um, that, that we are doing quite well. We now have a very different um, or difficult situation with regard of the school opening. Uh, we have very, very intense discussions here in Germany about this and I know that it's similar in other parts of the European Union. And we will see, um, even there we are still learning. We have to look for concepts of social distancing for, for pupils, which is very difficult according to the age. We have to separate the classes. We probably have to work on the curricula and and um, do some things uh, or leave some things out that we used to do, like singing in, in music classes and these sort of things. But this is something that we have to adapt now, I think, as a society, at least for a transition phase. Right, but, but Maria, bringing it back to a point that you made a few moments ago, really the, the power of communication, being consistent with the messaging, etc., it does look as if we may be heading towards this second wave of a pandemic. If the messaging falls short in some way, shape or, or form, isn't there the risk of the EU losing perhaps respect amongst members of the, of the population in Europe? And dare I say it, perhaps some member states feeling, well, maybe it's time to part company with the EU or if we stay within the EU, redefine the relationship on terms that we feel we can live and work with. Well, let me start with the, the, the second part of your question. I really don't believe that uh, uh, this is jeopardizing the EU in any way. Um, I think it's clear for the public that we need coordinated actions and the EU has already delivered in many, on many levels. So I, I just don't see uh, any realistic threat in, in that respect. 
But in terms of uh, you know uh, the the risk that politicians run, uh, naturally, uh, the the quality of outcomes uh, will determine how successful politicians have been. And you know, as Sebastian said, I think there are the, t the politicians are there to take the tough decisions. They are faced with dilemmas. Close downs are, of course, the way to deal with the pandemic. But you know, you suffocate the economy at the same time. How do you manage that? And this is not an easy dilemma to resolve. What's important is to have clear information from all the experts. And again, as Sebastian said, all the experts around the, uh, the, the issue that are relevant uh, uh, for, for providing information. The politicians have a very, bal very careful and very sensitive balancing act to manage. And, you know, making sure that we save lives, that we protect the public from being infected, but at the same time ensuring that people can live. They have the means to live. You know, the households have been suffering as a result of the close down. All of this is a dilemma and politicians will have to resolve this dilemma and indeed the quality of these decisions will determine how they are perceived in the public. That is the, that is the job of politicians and this is no different. And, and, and uh, Dr Clarkson, is it, is it fair to say that perhaps the risks of walking away from the block are a deterrent in themselves? In other words, COVID-19 has killed off whatever aspirations some countries may once have harboured of, of leaving the bloc? And is it possible as well that they're, they're looking at what happens to the United Kingdom at the end of this year? Because that is when Britain officially leaves the European Union, the EU. I think it's always, we one should always say, ne never say never. I think it's an issue of risks and probabilities, but certainly the probabilities have gone down significantly. And if we're going to learn lessons from this, one of the biggest policy lessons that's to be learned, and there's actually lessons shared across the EU, another reason why EU institutions have, have played such an important role is the extent to which any kind of crisis of this nature doesn't just involve one policy area. It's not just a public health crisis that involves health services. The resilience of EU states and EU societies has been that many, particularly Italy, very quickly identified the fact that this is a civil defense crisis. The term civil defense kind of fell out of fashion after the Cold War. But it's a civil defense crisis where you have to have all state actors working together from education to health to military to gendarmerie, carabinieri, to civil defense agencies, civil protection agencies, as well as hospitals, care homes, and so on. And I think there's also a, a kind of discussion we could have about European or, or sort of a set of crisis responses that also we find in places like uh, democracies like South Korea that maybe the UK could learn from in terms of the need for substantial state capacity. And this is a lesson for the EU. And in a sense, austerity is a threat to national security. The states that coped best were the states that, despite the pressures of the Eurozone crisis, were states like Italy that had substantial state capacity in key areas, that had the carabinieri, the police on the ground, the health services like Germany, the testing capacity. And that it's essentially if the EU is to survive, if liberal democracy is just to survive, they're going to have to invest and expand in state capacity to be able to deal with whatever future crisis they face in as an all-round issue. Maybe this is also a lesson for diplomats and diplomatic services about the extent to which they need crisis response teams, that, that the investment that's already been there needs to be, be, be beefed up to help crisis response teams, interagency cooperation, a kind of national security framework that treats security and civil defense in a rounded sense and not just focused on specific policy fields with every crisis. That's maybe a lesson that you can learn as well. OK, let's break away from this for the moment, from the Q&A session, because what I want to do now is to introduce the Twitters. A, a number of people have responded to our call for them to get involved. Uh, again, this is not directed at anyone in particular, but uh, please do feel free to take it on. Uh, the Twitter says, what does diplomacy have to do with it? Seems that countries first and foremost follow their own national interests in fighting COVID-19, which appears to contradict the optimism that we had at the beginning of our discussion that uh, the every man for himself mentality has been thrown overboard. But uh, this particular messenger disagrees. Who's going to respond to that? Well, probably if, I, if I, I, may... I start. Oh, no, go oh, ahead, sure, Maria. So Okay, Maria no and then Sebastian. Okay. I mean, I, I just like to use some of Sebastian's words, actually, to say that, I mean, uh, you know, the multilateralism, which is actually, uh, you know, another word for cooperation, uh, is not necessarily uh, contradicting uh, the need for a nation state. And, you know, the mistakes apart that were done at the beginning, which I think we've all acknowledged that, um, you know, they do don't contradict. The country uh, can protect itself by engaging in multilateral dialogue. And I think it's, it's, it's crucial that uh, we understand that. We will never fight the pandemic and we will never
never fight uh, climate change, issues like climate change, if we don't understand that cooperation at the EU level and at the global level is pivotal. So I just don't see the two as antagonistic. Okay, and Sebastian? Yeah, from the, from the very practical side, probably what diplomacy is there for. I mean, um, in April, for example, we had a G20 meeting um, of, of um, I think, finance ministers. Um, and um, part of this meeting also was, was prepared by, um, by civil servants, by diplomats. And one of the outcomes of this meeting was a moratorium um, of debt um, for the Global South. That's a very concrete uh, result. Some may say it's not enough, but I would say it's 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 a beginning, and it's the uh, it's it was an important decision um, with regard to um, to um, reaching out to the global south. The second example is the question: How do we reform the global health system? How do we reform uh, global institutions like the WHO in order to be better prepared? Uh, for the next pandemic or the next event that might affect us. And uh, in this regard, you, you have difficult negotiations because you're talking about a lot of money, you're talking about political decisions, you're also talking about uh, models of, of governance, um, how, how you steer processes, how inclusive, how transparent are these processes. And um, if we don't act there decisively also as countries coming from the so-called liberal, liberal democracies. I think we, we will lose ground in this in this process. So this is also something now um, where we have to fight for our values, for our norms, and where, where we stand for as as the family of nations that is still being part of, of the West, uh, not not geographically, but more ideally. And I think this is this is uh, extremely important. And and COVID made this even more clearer and brought this brought this brought this more to the forefront how important it is okay let me come in now with another a twitter comment which i would like uh, dr alex clarkson to address first and then if my other guests wish to respond please do feel free this reads how can the eu transfer its successful approach towards the pandemic into real power gains vis-a-vis -vis the united states and china dr clarkson um, if we look in terms of the EU simply defending its own space and it's defending its own system, I think that despite the pretty bad impression left in that in early phase in March, the EU's recovered a lot, the EU's managed to build up. China's initial advantage in terms of coming out and selling its model of crisis response has diminished very rapidly as a lot of criticism and frustration with Chinese policy responses have emerged. The same with the US. I think it's also this this leads up to a very, very difficult question for the EU. As the EU operates increasingly, obviously it's some, still a multilateral institution in some ways, but it's increasingly state-like in others. It's the question is how far does it want to get into even a competitive dynamic with the US and China? How far does it even want to leave that impression? And I think it's a very, very difficult challenge for the EU. I think the EU should, as far as possible, avoid such a competitive dynamic to present itself as a force for cooperation. The moment it gets into geopolitical power games, it ends up into games that it will likely only damage all sides. So as far as possible, maybe the EU wants to pull out of that kind of discourse and frame it can present itself as something different and something less interested in, in a form of celebrating great power competition and more maybe an actor that can bring other great powers together. Okay, and would our other guests like to respond to that before I move on to our final tweet? Yeah, if I, if I may, um, I, I, I don't believe the, the EU has got the ambition of being a global hegemon. I think the EU, the way that it sees itself, is much more a, um, a, a union of projecting soft power rather than hard power. You know, all the, um, the positions that the EU has taken in the global scene has been, have been positions of multilateralism, of global cooperation. And to the extent that the EU can exert leadership in certain things, it would be a very specific thing. And again, a demonstration of soft power, for example, the GDPR, or the, uh, the fight against global uh, climate change. So I actually don't think that there is an ambition to become a hegemon. Uh, however, and, and here I really have some sympathy for some of the things that Alex has said, uh, for the EU to protect itself and to protect its interests and its way of life, 
um, it does need to get start important positions and get into the game, understand what it thinks about China, understands what it feels about the non-cooperative US. So this global shifting of, uh, of leadership position do affect uh, the position that the EU needs to take, but all of that in the context of protecting its own interests rather than of being a global hegemon. OK, let's go on to our final Twitter, and I'd like all of you to respond. How can diplomacy work effectively without its main driver? In other words, the direct contact and exchange. How can diplomacy work effectively without its main driver, the direct contact and exchange? Sebastian. Well, indeed, this is a challenge. This is a challenge for all of us. Um, um, uh, fortunately enough, um, uh, at least our minister started uh, to travel again, so he's, he has the possibility to meet his counterparts and we already had one foreign affairs council also meeting physically uh, in Brussels and of course we had also the European Council meeting physically and there you see how important this, it is to see eye to eye um, the other participants of these uh, very complex and difficult negotiations. But uh, what the question is alluding to is indeed um, a challenging situation. For example, if we if we talk about uh, political negotiations with regard to crisis, to to political crisis, to military crisis. So how how do we achieve, for example, to bring together the different um, actors uh, of the Lib Libyan uh, Libyan um, uh, civil war uh, and and conflict in a situation where we are not in a position to gather 200 or 300 or 400 people in a room, which sometimes is necessary in order to build up the spirit of negotiation and trust. On the other hand, I think um, um, already the, um, the, the diplomacy and international politics learned a lot. So the push that we had um, as the foreign ministry also in Berlin with regard to um, the use of digital tools for our work has never been as strongly felt as as through um, through COVID. So um, we invested a lot in our digital equipment, and we made really quantum leaps also in in, in the use of it. Because um, owning it is one thing, but then uh, using it and also benefiting from it is another. And what we have now much more frequently than before for example is video conferences with parts of our network all over the world also with think tanks and diplomatic partners so we as policy planning now we have um, regular video meetings with our counterparts otherwise you would have traveled probably to the netherlands uh, to uk to france now you do it online and it's functioning but by the end of the day, the personal contact, um, the personal relationship is an asset and is extremely important, especially in this field of diplomacy. OK, and can I have a response, please, from Dr. Alex Clarkson to that final tweet? I think however much uh, there has been a kind of a digital revolution in diplomacy, I think there's a lesson to be learned here about the value of having, particularly in terms of states bordering the EU, the, the lesson of having the value of having diplomats. Um, people from in intelligence services or military personnel on the ground. And I think after 20, 30 years of ongoing budget cuts that many EU states have done in terms of investing in diplomatic personnel, I think there's now strong argument in terms of beefing up the size of emb embassies, uh, developing inter more active interagency processes so that military personnel can be deployed or, or placed or intelligence services personnel can be placed or public health and civil defense personnel like THV can be placed in all of these countries because the assumption that you can always travel in or deal with something electronically in this kind of crisis has been thrown up into question. It's sometimes more valuable to make a risk assessment and say actually we need 20, 30, 40 people in this embassy in this key state neighboring the EU that know what's going on and that if we can't travel can go out and still represent our interests. Just look at the size of the Italian delegation or the Italian presence in Tripoli and the ability of the Italians to reach through and figure out what's going on there. That I think is a very strong lesson that needs to be taken on board by other European diplomatic services that maybe it's time to invest more and put more people and build more embassies and build more positions where you have people on the ground that can represent your interests more actively without having to worry about a Wi-Fi connection or whether you can fly in or out. Okay, and finally, Maria de Mertzis. I don't believe that uh, any relationship, how, however uh, uh, yeah, 
impersonal or however professional does not need uh, the physical, the personal relationship. I think there's a lot to be said. I mean, the very expression eye to eye comes from the fact that we have to look each other eye to eye to be able to really understand what is going on. Um, so, you know, there is, there is a loss here as a result of having to do everything digitally um, and, and we have to reckon with that. On the other hand, there's also a gain. I mean, just the digital transformation that we've all had to quickly be educated in uh, actually is saving the environment. Uh, so, you know, it's just making us look at things that are in a slightly different way. And I think it's important to actually understand that as well. However, I do believe that diplomatic relations will have to uh, come back, fall back on, on personal relations and on the ability uh, to see and understand and feel uh, the issues as they come uh, in, in personal discussions. So I think for the moment we have to uh, perhaps reckon with that loss uh, in order to make sure that we fight the pandemic. But once that stops to exist, ceases to exist, we need to slowly come back to something new, a new normal, not the old normal, some new normal in which then the physical relation can also play an important role. Okay, a sound note on which to end, but that's it from all of us. I'd like to thank my guests, Sebastian Groth, Maria de Mercis and Dr. Alex Clarkson for their time. And thanks too to you for watching. We'll see you again soon in the next Diplomacy in Dialogue. For now, goodbye. <laughs>